Oh my god, I just love financial maths. Oh, I can't tell you how much I enjoy calculating compound interest and modeling depreciation with the recurrence relations. Seriously, does anyone actually expect us to enjoy this stuff? Hi, my name is Andy, and if you are anything like me, you probably hate financial maths the most. So today I'm going to try and help out and try to explain what the hell is going on. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of financial maths, we actually have to first talk about sequences. A sequence is literally just a list of numbers with one term following another. It could be a random sequence of numbers with no pattern. If they have a pattern, then they're called rule-based sequences. We use these things called recurrence relations to help us describe sequences with patterns and predict what numbers come next. Each number in the sequence has a position. Remember that we start at 0 instead of 1 so that the 0th position is actually the first number in the sequence. Yeah, I know it's weird, but just go with it and don't think about it too much. Isn't that what your teachers tell you anyway? These relations are made up of two parts, a starting point number in the 0th position, which is 5 in our example, and then a rule that tells us how to modify the starting point to get to the next term in the sequence, in our case, adding by 5. Okay, but what's the point of all of this other than for your education? Well, we can use it to model depreciation, and we have three different types. The first is flat rate depreciation, where the value of an asset reduces by the same amount per period. The recurrence relation for this is here, where d is the same amount of depreciation for each period. The second is unit cost depreciation, where depreciation is based on how frequently an asset is used. Kind of like how the more you spend your time procrastinating, the more you realize how f***ed you are for your exam. The recurrence relation is the same as flat rate depreciation, but instead of n representing the number of periods, it represents how many times the asset has been used instead. The third is reducing balance depreciation, where the asset's value depreciates by a fixed percentage. We can use this recurrence relation to find the asset's value, where the compounding factor is less than 1 since the asset goes down in value. Now, at the moment we're only able to predict just one step ahead, but what if we wanted to predict more than one step ahead? Well, I got you. We can just use these formulas here to do that. Alright, I don't know about you, but I'm more of a cash guy than an asset guy, so let's talk about money. Now, imagine this is you and this is the bank. You have two choices in this relationship. Your first choice is that you could borrow money from the bank called a loan. The initial amount of money is called the principal. Unfortunately, no bank is ever going to let you just borrow money for free, so that we charge you a borrowing fee known as interest. So basically the definition of interest is going to depend on whether or not you're borrowing from the bank or lending to the bank. Just kind of like how the definition of interest for that guy or girl depends on how drunk you are at the party. The second choice you could make is to actually give the bank your money, and that's called an investment, with the initial amount also called the principal. The bank is going to give you some compensation for that money, also known as interest. Now there are two types of interest rates, simple interest and compound interest. Simple interest is pretty straightforward. It's a constant amount of money that only depends on the initial amount that you either borrowed or invested. So, for example, you could borrow $100 from the bank, and the bank asks you to pay 10% of $100, which is $10, every year. After a year, you'd owe $110 in total, and after another year, you'd owe $120. Now, banks are cheeky f so they're more likely to use the second type of interest rate, which is more well known as compound interest. We'll use the same parameters as we did for simple interest, with compound interest also at 10%, and the principal being $100. Just like before, after a year, you'd owe $110 in total. Now, if you remember with simple interest, next year you only earn $10 more, but with compound interest, things are going to be different. Compound interest is calculated based on not just the initial principal, but the whole balance. So we need to pay 10% of $110 rather than $100. So now our balance for year 2 is $121 rather than $120, a whole dollar more than simple interest. It's not a lot right now, but over time it's going to keep compounding and compounding, just like your study scores if you study hard. In terms of recurrence relations, it's actually pretty similar to the ones from depreciation. For simple interest, remember that the interest amount is calculated only using the principal. We can find next period's balance by simply just adding the interest amount to our current balance. 
For compound interest, interest is calculated based on the current balance using a compounding factor greater than 1 since our current account balance always increases with interest. Here are those handy multi-step formulas if you need to calculate more than one step ahead. Now there's actually one more thing we have to talk about with compound interest and that's related to how frequently you're actually paying the interest. In our example before, the bank says that they would be willing to charge interest every single year. But what happens if they actually start charging you more frequently? Let's say we've got two banks. The first bank is called, I don't know, Cool Banks and the other one is called Dodgy Banks. Now Cool Banks is charging you 10% interest compounding every month and Dodgy Banks is also charging 10% interest but compounding every year instead. Which bank should we be borrowing money from? You might think to choose cool banks because why would you ever choose a bank called dodgy banks? But how can we really know for sure? We can use this thing called effective annual interest rate to balance everything out and help make our decision. How does it work? Well basically we're going to convert the compounding frequency of the interest rates as if they were compounding on a yearly basis. The formula is pretty long but it's not hard to use. We need to adjust the interest rate from cool banks because that's being compounded every month. But we don't need to adjust the interest rate from dodgy banks because that's already being compounded yearly. So let's use that formula and plug in our numbers and we calculate the effective annual interest rate to be 10.47% from cool banks. Now we can finally compare the interest rates fairly since both are based on a yearly frequency now. Who will we choose? Well, we choose dodgy banks because we'll always want lower interest if we're borrowing money, so we pay less. We'd only want higher interest rate if we're investing money, so we're earning more, or if we're feeling you know, really generous and want to donate some money to those poor, poor banks. So what did we learn after all this? Don't judge a bank by its name apparently. All right, we've finally arrived at the nitty gritty, and this is the part that probably is giving you the most headache within this course. We've got four scenarios we need to get through, so let's get straight into it. Consider scenario one, you've borrowed $100 from the bank. The bank is charging you 10% compound interest every year. You don't like that, but the bank will charge you more and more interest until you pay them back. Now you're gonna make a 300 IQ play. You're going to pay back $20 every year to cover your interest and repay your debt. Some of your payment goes into paying back your principal, and some of your payment pays back the interest that you owe. This is called a reducing balance loan because eventually you'll pay back exactly what you borrowed from the bank as well as whatever interest the bank has charged you one bit at a time. Now I'm going to talk about something that makes people nervous, amortization tables. Like a lot of people, you're probably confused as to what's going on. In a nutshell though, an amortization table is usually just the schedule it takes to get an account balance back down to zero. So using the example we've mentioned before, let's say you borrowed $100 from the bank. At the end of the first year, you'll have paid $20. $10 of which goes to paying off the interest, and the leftover $10 to pay a little bit back from the $100 that you borrowed originally. So now you only owe $90. Nice job. So just like last year, you're going to be paying $20, but this time only $9 is needed to pay off the interest. So now you have $11 left to pay off some principal. At the end, you'll have a balance of $79 left owing. This process continues until you have absolutely nothing left to pay. Make sure you readjust the last payment though, because if we only have $5.13 left over, there's no way we want to pay $20 because that's too much money to cover such a small amount. We've got to do some detective work to figure out how to make our final repayment cover just enough. We do know two things for certain. The first thing is that the interest charge is still 10% of our previous balance of $5.13. And the second is that we have to end up with exactly $0 left in the balance. Knowing these, we'll be able to figure out what the repayment amount is using some algebra, which is $5.64. Here's the recurrence relation for a reducing balance loan, where the balance for the next period can be determined essentially by the compound factor, because we're using compound interest, multiplied by the current balance and then subtracted by D, which is the repayment amount you make per period. Phew. All right, I know that scenario one was hard to take in, but I promise that the next few scenarios will be a lot easier to digest. With scenario two, instead of borrowing $100 from the bank, you give the bank $100 as an investment. The bank is glad and pays you 10% compound interest as compensation. Now, of course, you could decide to leave it in there and have the banks just keep paying you forever, but we all die at some point and it's probably shit you wanna buy before you die. 
So instead, you decide to take $20 out a year that includes the bank's interest paid and a little bit of whatever principal you initially invested. You keep taking $20 until the bank has no money left for you to take. This is called an annuity. Now, don't be nervous, but I'm going to ask you to look at the amortization tables again. So, you have $100 in your account balance, but you take out $20, $10 from the interest and $10 from the principal, so you're only left with $90 after the first year. The next year, you still take $20, but the interest only pays you $9, so your principal reduces by $11, meaning you've only got $79 left in your balance. Notice something? The values are exactly the same as the reducing balance loan amortization table. That's why the recurrence relation of an annuity is also the same as a reducing balance loan. All that's different is just the context of who is paying what. Now with scenario 3, we're going to piggyback off a little from scenario 2. You still invest $100, you still get 10% compound interest, and you still take money out. But instead of taking money out and includes the interest and a little bit of principal, you only take out the interest. You can calculate how much to take out using this recurrence relation. This is called a perpetuity, which means lasting forever. Just like how much your study score matters for the rest of your life. Let's quickly go back to the amortization table, and hopefully it's not too scary to you anymore. Again, you start investing $100, but instead of taking out $20, you only take out $10 from the bank as payment. The exact same amount of interest that the bank pays you. Next year rolls around, the bank gives you another $10 because it's only $100 in the account. See what's happening? You will always get paid $10 as long as you take exactly $10 each year and have $100 of principal. Okay, we finally come to scenario 4 now. So again, you invest $100, the bank pays you 10% compound interest, but this time, instead of taking money, you're going to add $20. That's right, you're just going to keep giving the poor bank more money. This is called an annuity investment. Going back to our old friend, the amortization table, we still get $10 of interest, but you also add $20, meaning that your total balance for year one is $130. Next year, you'll earn $13 of interest, but you decide to keep adding $20 to the account, giving you a total balance of $163. Your account is gonna get dummy thick, but only for as long as you keep feeding money and never taking anything out. Here's the recurrence relation. It's basically the same as a reducing balance loan, but instead of taking away money, you're adding more money via deposits. So that's it. That's the entire financial modeling section of the course. Hopefully it's been helpful to you guys. Either way, thanks for watching and you can go back to doing your procrastination or studying or whatever.